So can you tell me how did you got started on Airbnb back then when you were working on that? So um, let me see, 2017, probably 18. Yeah, 17. Um, so I, you know, I was a, a short term rental host in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I found out about it from, you know, various sources. And I, and I was, you know, to be honest with you, I was having some trouble in a specific building that I had, and I was either going to sell it or try this, right? So I took a chance and I, I put, it was a five unit building or two, two buildings with five units between them. And um, so I took a chance on one unit. And uh, as, as you know, with, with Airbnb, your first one's always gonna cost the most cause you gotta kind of get used to what things cost to do. Um, but it, you know, as soon as I did it, it started to produce, right? And this is, you know, back before everybody and their grandma was doing Airbnb, but um, they, you know, that, that started to produce results. And so I decided to go all in and convert um, the two unit and the three unit to five units for Airbnb. That's kind of got how I got started. And over the, over time, I expanded to about 25 or might've been 28 at the, at the highest point. Um, it's hard to say because one of them is kind of like a shared space. So it's kind of like, do you count each room or do you count the whole building? So the numbers kind of throw me off there on how somebody would count that, but each we had one building that had six individual units, um, as rooms, as shared space. So, you know, that would have been six, but it was an all in one building. So, um, you know, between 20, 25 to 28 were, you know, I was managing and, um, and operating and of those, so, you know, the three flavors of hosting is usually you own and operate, you know, you, you don't have arbitrage. You're just doing, uh, you, you just taking your own property. So that's the one. Um, the second would be on rental arbitrage. You'd go out there and you would lease an apartment, uh, negotiate that and, and, you know, make the spread in between. So I had a, a good amount of those two, um, after I took over all the properties that I could. And the third is co-hosting, which each one of those has pros and cons to it. Um, to be honest with you, co-hosting is almost just being an employee. Um, and you have cost to that. So it's imagine you being an employee with like a lot of, you know, overhead, especially if you have, you know, a built, you know, if you're using stuff like price labs or, um, hostfully or, um, you know, just integrations that you have to pay for each, you know, host that you take on each co-hosting duty has a set of expenses that go with it. You know, you know, you might have a, a virtual assistant that's helping operate part-time even. And so the, the cost associated with that, you know, I want to say that for me, as I recall, if, as a co-host, I was, I, I'd have to, you know, between services and an employee, um, I'd have $180 or so per unit that I would co-host that had to be covered. So the trick with that is you don't want to be co-hosting a property that's not making that much money because you won't even cover your nut with their if it's like I said, if it's like a $2,000 small apartment, it's kind of not worth it. So that's something I learned, you know, just by doing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I got all sorts of flavors of, uh, of Airbnb, you know, um, operations, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And out of those three, um, operations, you said own and manage, uh, rental average and go hosting. Which one is your favorite and why? Which one brings like less expenses to you and more revenue? Ideally, and this has got to keep in mind that it's because of taxes that own and operate is going to be your best bet. And, you know, obviously you spend the most money there because you have to buy a property, then you have to furnish it. So it's not just buying a property and then putting it into, turning it into a rental. You also got to do the setup costs and then utilities and everything are on top are on you as well maintenance everything so everything is on you so you have complete and total control having said that complete and total responsibility so the benefits being like hey you know uh, uh you if you bought the property right and you didn't try to buy it based off of like 
a lot, I see a lot of people trying to sell it off the potential for a short term vacation, uh, a short term rental, and they'll call that the cash flow. Like that's going to be actual cash flow. Um, terrible idea. Would never buy a property based off of that because, as we've been seeing, um, you know, whatever you know location you're at, the local um, legislators can change their heart, mind and heartbeat about is it going to be legal? What's going to be the um, what's going to be the new standards and unless you have something in place where like you know in florida where they can never really shut down vacation rentals totally um you know you might buy something way overpriced just because you think you're going to get airbnb type money and find out that you know f four months after you bought it something changed and now you're screwed so the benefits of ownership is like if that happens you can kind of just switch back to long term um, or medium term is ideal because if you're already if you already started as a short term rental company, you'd want to go after the um, maybe you know short term rentals obviously the highest and you know highest prices you're going to get, but the medium term rentals the corporate renters the you know traveling nurses the workforce people the corporate renters everybody's going after them but you know you could probably get a piece of that too depending on your location or how good your marketing and branding is. Um, having said that, that would be my favorite, but it's also the most expensive but you get to control everything. The reason why arbitrage is so hot is because people think you can get in for like less money, but it's also way riskier if you think about it, because there's no, you're not gonna get your money back from a lease. You might get some of your money back from furniture, but probably not because you're buying it at, you know, buying expensive furniture generally, or just brand new. And all you gotta do is go on Facebook Marketplace to see, you know, people selling brand new furniture for cheap. So it's kind of like, and there's a lot more work involved trying to put together something cheaply. So sometimes it's better to just, you know, go to one place and get everything nice and coordinated. Um, but with arbitrage too, like if you haven't ne negotiated a great lease or something past a year, um, you're probably not going to make your money back. For me, my calculation was I would not be make my money back normally until 18 months after, after 18 months in spot where I'd get all my money back, right? Because yes, you're making money on that time period, but you're also spending it. So realistically, you might be making three times the amount of a normal rental. And this is, keep in mind, this is for like a smaller one, maybe two bedroom, three and four or five bedroom houses have different numbers. So yes, you can make more money, but there's still more maintenance, more cleaning, more everything, right? So it's kind of relative, but um, with arbitrage, you got to be in a place like a year and a half just to break even after everything that you're spending there. So people don't really kind of see that they see the money coming in, but they're forgetting how much they're spending to keep it up. So it's kind of like three times the income, but two times the amount of work and expense. You have to kind of decide like, is it really worth it for me to do this, to be constantly landing planes, as I like to call it on the weekends, on Fridays, when everybody's coming in and making sure everything's clean on Sundays when everybody's going out. And that's the kind of norm. Um, how much of that is it really worth to me? And you'll never know until you hit a market and kind of get a, get a taste of one to see, but as a market might get oversaturated or you might just have a, a you know, a big, a unique property, the more unique property, obviously you can't you cannot say like across the board, everybody's gonna make this kind of money because it's a unique property. It makes money because it's a unique property, sometimes because of the location, but sometimes it's just because it's so unique that it's just gonna always be in demand. So what kind of product you're putting out, it's really not about it's the prettiest or the most well-designed, it's like how unique is it really? Um, because at the end of the day, not too many people wanna pay $300 a night for a one bedroom Unless that one bedroom happens to be, I don't know, on the top of a mountain hanging over a cliff or something. I don't know. Or you're in the middle of the woods or a tree house or something like that. Because they can go get a hotel for a lot cheaper and, and not have to pay a cleaning fee. And, you know, not have to worry about parking or neighbors or trash or doing chores, as they like to say now. Like people, people are complaining like uh, Airbnb is like a hotel except with chores. I thought that was kind of funny, but kind of true too. So I hope that explains kind of what you were asking me. Yes, it explains completely. And about rental arbitrage, there are also some, you know, challenges when it comes to um, get chicken bees, for example, the landlord and stuff like that. Do you get to experience that? Yeah. So one of them, one of the th things about rental arbitrage is you, 
you kind of halfway got to be a property inspector. Like people getting into rent, rental arbitrage that have no real estate experience at all are going to be hurt because I don't know if you've ever just moved into an apartment, but you know, the first day you go through, they make you sign off on like, do the lights work? How's the water pressure? And sometimes you just run through it, right? But unless you stay in a place for a while, you're not going to know that now you have a slow clog. Now you have a toilet that runs a lot. Now you have a leak that just started to show up because, the, you know, when you moved in, the landlord painted it over, but now it's a chronic situation. But now you're in bed with this person. So it's it's these chronic problems that pop up that sort of affect your guest's experience and then how fast the landlord is to respond to these problems. Because if it's me and I know it's messing with my money and I own the place, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to make it happen like that. Somebody's going to come fix that like right away because obviously it affects your um your reviews, right? Versus, you know, a regular, a regular tenant is not going to be needing some, they'll complain, but it's not like they can leave a review on Airbnb about you or Google or whatever. Um, landlord speed to handle you is the same. Their, their attitude is the same as if you were a regular tenant because you are renting monthly from them. So you got to be prepared to come out of your pocket and have like something in place that like pre-negotiate and say, look, if I have to fix this problem, I'm taking it out of your rent. And that causes issues sometimes because if you have an automatic rent payment, then you gotta go in and mess with it. So there's all these kind of wrinkles to arbitrage that people don't really get. They only see like, oh, I can get in for, I can get all in for $5,000 and start making Airbnb money. Great until you have a crappy landlord that just took you because he was looking for a consistent tenant but wasn't really that, you know, um, diligent about keeping his tenants happy. You know what I mean? So I experienced a little bit of that. And then COVID definitely showed how some landlords are going to be because they got desperate and they start putting, for example, we had a, a building that we had five units in, um, like an apartment building. It was like 40 apartments and they had just bought it and they were starting to do renovations and then COVID hit. So then because of COVID, they started accepting any old person to, to hold rent, including like, I hate to say it, but section eight tenants. And the last thing you want to see when you're going to stay somewhere, like a, like some kind of place where, you know, the pictures look great and, and things look great is looking and watching people walking around, you know, half undressed in hallways, smoking weed and cooking on, you know, cooking and talking loud on phones, like really obnoxious because they don't care they, they're not there for the they, they don't care they don't have pride of ownership i guess you can say most people that are renters in a nicer building will but if you start putting in renters that you're just putting in to you know, stabilize a building you end up with this mess so i literally had to like abandon five units because that's what happened in the middle of covid and i was like look i can't keep having this experience people worrying about you know people knocking at their door in the middle of the night you know, thinking it's somebody else's apartment because somebody else used to live there banging on the door crazy, like just nonsense like that. They weren't keeping up their end of like the property management. So I was just like, look, I got to break these leases because you guys are you're killing me. Like we can't keep people in here. We keep having to give people money back. So some things that look great in the beginning don't turn out. So after, you know, and you can't blame the pandemic, you know, hit everybody. So that's not the biggest issue, the biggest issue is how you handle it moving forward and um, detach without being unethical or, um, you know, just bad, doing bad business. I mean, you can't drown with people, but you can't like also just trash a lease or something like that because that also affects people. So that that's the, that's the part of rental arbitrage that I think a lot of people would not be able to handle you know, come another pandemic or just any kind of challenges like that. How do they handle it? I don't know. So. Yeah. What you just said is very important. It is actually my first time listening about this because usually when people tend to talk about rental average, they just talk about the good side of it. Um, these challenges are what is really important to know about, um, to be transparent about your experience. So other people know what they might get into if they try arbitrage, right? So thank yeah. you for uh, telling us about this. And one thing I'd like to know is how much you were making back then with Airbnb and why did you decide to quit? 
Uh, it's hard to say because I, I, you know, they frown on it, but I have multiple accounts, um, three accounts. So <laughs> one, you, you should always have more than one because they are just, their algorithms been canceling people left and right um, for a lot of different reasons. I'm hearing because of background checks or people that are, are even associated with them. Somebody with a, with a, somebody with a jail record logs into their Wi-Fi somehow. Next thing you know, your, your account is, is so many dumb things going on. But back before that was the craziness, I would say, you know, at one point we were, I think we were getting close to like 90 across all of them, but they, they didn't stay that good. It's just because, um, for all the reasons I said, you know, so apartments started getting like leaks and then we were getting bad reviews and, and really I had to have one account that was kind of like, I call it the quarantine account where it would just be, you'd put a property on there and give it like, you know, two or three stays to just make sure that it was okay. And then I would move it from that one to a better, like more reviewed, um, account and just take all the information and just re take, shut the one down and put it on the other one. So I actually had like one account, like I said, it was like a quarantine account in case anything goes wrong. You know, that account means nothing to me. And, you know, having said that, you know, we, you know, we were, we were able to we never got shut down. And if we ever had like two or three bad ones in a row, we would just get rid of that one account and start another one just to keep it so that we would know when you're doing arbitrage, especially, or even co-hosting, whenever these problems sneak up on you, it's not killing you from, you know, as you're getting going. Cause you know, like when you first start, get started, they give you a lot of extra uh, SEO and put you higher in the placings to get you rolling. So you take advantage of that, but then when it goes away, you're going to be screwed if you have like three and four stars. Right. So that was something I sort of developed over time. Um, I would say, like I said, the top, at the, the top, we might've been doing like 90. And I say we, cause at that point I was, I had like two people helping me. So mm -hmm. not all mine, but you know. <laughs> yeah. And, um, that quarantine account you told me about is also good to saving yourself, like from the bad reviews that you might get at the start, because that one listing is not in its best condition yet when it's starting. Right. So it's a really good strategy. I've never heard about that. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and, that, and, and that's like I said, there's things with those you'll never know until somebody stayed there. I'll tell you one in particular, like if you can ever avoid being on the top, I guess, I mean, if it's a high, if it's a high, um, uh, high value, a uh, swanky place of really like a new construction, I would never on an older building, like anything like that's just not brand new take a top floor because all the heat rises and no matter how much air conditioning you put into a place, all the heat from the whole building goes up there. And God forbid, that's where your bedroom is was because I had a, like a, a unique property like that, but I had to get an extra air conditioner just to put in there and, and, and buy one of those portable ones because the heat was just so bad that it would overwhelm what was already there and like cook people. And I was like, that was one of them that thank God I had that quarantine account, but had I not, and it, when I, when I first got the property, it was like in nicer weather, but once summer hit, it was like ungodly. And I, you know, I had, you know, I found out the hard way I had to put on, put in my own external um, portable um, air conditioner in that place just to make it bearable for people, which was, you know, you don't know that until you're in there in the summer and got, you know, maybe you got your arbitrage property in the winter or the spring or the fall, you won't know that. So. And how did you came with the idea of that one quarantine um, account you have? You have, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm a I'm a retired firefighter, and we always have like multiple plans. <laughs> so I just take and think like, okay, everything's great, but what happens if something goes wrong? What happens? Some, so I just started to put up these measures in case and test them out, and it you know it it was necessary. So. I just like back, I like at least a plan B and a plan C with everything I do. That's good to know. And uh, one thing we'd like to know about is why did you decided to quit on Airbnb? Even after all of these um, buildings you already owned and all this profit you are making, why did you decided to just quit that? Um, um, a few things. One, well, COVID was the big reason for, for a lot of it. 
because I just had to get out of most of the arbitrage units. Um, it was just, it was taking more than it was giving because of what I, you know, I mentioned the moving in, moving in bad elements into one apartment building, um, affecting, you know, one account, um, travel was just shut down completely in Philadelphia for like, uh, longer than most places actually. So it was more like to, to stop the bleeding. Um, the ones I owned that were the last to go. I, so I, I actually, I moved from Philadelphia. So I was like, I mentioned, I was a, a firefighter. I retired. And when COVID hit, um, I decided that I just want, didn't want to live in Philadelphia anymore because I didn't like what was going on. I thought it was ridiculous. I saw what the administration was doing. Uh, I didn't, you know, we're not going to get into all the specifics just because people feel the way they feel. I just felt for me and my family, I needed to, us to be out of there. So I decided to leave. I said, I can go and start this somewhere else. So we ended up um, moving in Tampa just in time. Um, when I got here, I, you know, my management that was still in place for the ones that I still had wasn't really doing a great job. I thought I had a pretty good handle on it, but come to find out when you're, when they say the cat's away, the mice will play. It wasn't so much that, but everything that used to cost me, let's say, $10 when I was there would cost me six and seven times that. So every little thing just got way more expensive for me to do. And it got to the point where I was like, you know, this long distance handling of it, um, I don't, it's not worth it to me because like it just, it, it, it bugs me. Right. So that I started, you know, I started seeing some things about Airbnb I didn't like specifically. Um, and it was accumulation of things. And then some of it was instinct. I was just like, it's getting oversaturated. Um, I would rather pull back and do something in the industry, but not that because I personally like to operate in places where there's like, like I have a little niche and I had, I had one there, um, that I really liked, but again, being far away, it wasn't really working anymore. And the travel industry across the board was kind of knocked sideways. So. I was just like, well, you know what? I think I'm just going to pull out and then start over when things get better or when I like, when I like the environment again. To that end, I sort of just did nothing for a year. I kind of de, uh, what do you call it? Um, unattached myself from everything so that I could kind of look look at it from like a thousand, you know, thousand foot view instead of being too close to it. And that's kind of where you know my my tech company kind of came from, which was. One of the things that bugged me the most was trash became such a problem, something so small, but it affected everything. Um, you know, a lot of people, you, you know, if you ever go on the boards, people are like, oh, this area is sketchy. Um, you know, you, in urban areas, there's not a lot of room for things, right? Like there's just, we don't have a lot of garages. We don't have, we have some alleyways. We don't have big yards or anything. So storing trash or just, you know, and if you're in a hospitality business, Trash is important because if you don't get rid of it quickly, you get the, you, you don't get the bed bugs. So people bring the bed bugs, but you'll get the, you know, the roaches, the fleas, the flies, the rats, you'll get mm -hmm. everything as clean as you keep your building. They're going to find it. Right. So if you can't store it outside because the neighbors are because you get fined or whatever, and you can't um, store it inside because you're attracting these pests and affecting um, reviews and getting, you know, you're like damned if you do and damned if you don't. So it became such a big problem. And I, and I had some people working on it, but it was always agony, like to find the right person to make sure they got it out on time, that I didn't catch a fine, um, that I didn't piss off neighbors. And it was just kind of like this complicated problem from something that we all kind of disregard. And it affected the, you know, affected the surroundings too, because, you know, I don't know if people have been to New York lately, but just seeing trash on a sidewalk, that kind of stuff just puts you in a bad mood. So if you want to go on vacation and you want to see maybe not the beach, but like you want to be somewhere and you want to feel like you're like relaxed and enjoying yourself. The last thing you want to see is a piles of trash smelling like dead fish and dead bodies. What you're walking. It doesn't matter if the place is gorgeous. If you smell that or see that it throws you off. It gives, messes up your attitude. So I look at that and I was like, you know what, this is a problem that I want to sink my teeth into and never, thought I would be the person to do this, but apparently God saw it different and put a bunch of things in my lap and said, you're the guy. And you know, here I am, but 
I created this this app called Trash Meter because you know short term rental hosts, um, small businesses, cleaning companies, you know, uh, restaurants even or just people that have a party in their home. Like we just had Memorial Day weekend, and people are like, "Who's gonna pick up my trash?" And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know right now because you know the the city might take off. And you know if you live in a place that gets hot or just you have a, pre, a, a, a you don't have a lot of um, room, and you just did a big cookout, and now you got all this food in the trash, you're going to attract the rats, the fleas, the dogs, the cats, the raccoons, the bears, wherever you're at. Or if you got to put it in a hot garage, it's going to stink up your garage. So there's just people out there that just like, I don't want that. I don't want to be waiting for five days for this. And that's what we're there for. And that's, it, it became the beginning of something, but right now that's what it is. We're like Uber for trash. We, we get rid of two to 10 bags quickly. We're under the amount that a normal junk person would pay attention to. Like when you call those guys out, it's usually over a hundred bucks to just show up and it's two guys in a truck and you don't need all that. You got two, three bags. You're like, well, I just don't have time to take it to the dump myself. Well, that's what we're for. We we're there for that in between kind of a little bit too much for you, but not enough for the other guys. And you don't want to spend, you know, a hundred dollars. You want to spend 50 or whatever. So like that, that's where we live. Can you tell us a little bit more about how does the app works? How does the person who wants the trash taken out contact this person who is going to come and take the trash out? How much are the prices for it and stuff like that? So right now we're still, you know, it's still just literally what, uh, you know, it's on the app store now, but trashmitter.com, you could go and download your Google or um, Google or iPhone. Um, you we're only available right now in Philadelphia, but people could start to sign up. And when they do, we start to make a list of where we're being asked for. So ideally we're going to, you know, spread out to, you know, Tampa, Miami, uh, and Dallas, like there's places we already kind of know we're going to be headed, but right now we're just in Philadelphia vicinity trying to work out the kinks. So we're still kind of fundraising and still fixing it, but it works like Uber. Like you would go on, um, you put in your address, you, you know, your, your credit card, everything that, you know, to set up your account, put in your address and you'll like basically say, I, you know, take a picture of the, like, you could say, I got three bags I need to get rid of. You put in three, like you just pick three and then you take a picture of it so that we know like where it is. So ideally we tell people, Hey, just put it wherever your address is to make it easy right in front. And then when we're up and running, ideally we want to be kind of like dominoes half an hour or less, but we don't have enough people yet. So it's more like a couple hours, but, um, we, you know, you would press the button and then the, you know, the, the sign goes out, the, the, the chirp goes out to the potential drivers. And as we fill that up with, you know, like Lyft and Uber drivers, or anybody that just wants to do this as a side gig, because the cool thing about Airbnb type trash really is like, most of it is not nasty trash. It's kind of like, junk food wrappers and pizza boxes and stuff like that. So people are like, oh, my car is going to get nasty. It's like, well, you can put something in the trunk or tarp even. And this stuff's really not that bad. But of course, that's right now. So who knows what they're going to do in the future. But um, yeah, so, you know, basically you, you call it and then we find, you know, we send somebody, they come, they pick it up, they take a picture to verify that they took it and then it's gone. Like we take it to a, a local dump um a passing by truck eventually we want to be tied into all the other junkers and even the city systems where our people could kind of just see one close by and throw it off there and then they would share the cost so you know you don't have to drive far you could literally just be in you know a one or two square mile radius and never have to leave that because there's always some place to put it that's kind of the where we're going with it and eventually it'll just be waste management across the world is just crowdsourced that way. And then we can start working on litter. I mean, the, the future of this thing is we're trying to make an app where uh, a game where like Pokemon kids would pick up litter and pick it up and they would get cryptocurrency for the rewards uh, for every piece of trash or glass or mask or whatever they pick up. They would get reward points that we would eventually turn into crypto. You can go on a store and put, you know, buy stuff with it. That's where we're going with this. Cause we're, I didn't want to look at this as a, simple solution just for Airbnb hosts. When I think of things, I want it, I want it to be bigger than that. I want it to be useful for everybody. So I went in with the thought of like, now how can I change, how can I make Airbnb hosts life better? I went into thinking, how can I make the whole world a better place? And then 
that's kind of where this all came from. So this is just the beginning of it, though. That's a great idea. And are you going to continue, like in the future, working with um, Airbnb hosts and uh, this type of people you're gathering right now? I mean, yeah, they're always going to be my people. Um, in fact, I run multiple Airbnb host groups because I can advise. It's not like you know, I I don't want to, I don't want to be the guru type person that's out there selling education because to me it's kind of a zero sum game you know for me to keep up on that stuff and be day-to-day -day activities there's people better at it than i am right but i still want to give value so what i do is i just create a i just create really welcoming places where people get actual information um that you know we we try to give them all sorts of um like right now i'm creating a, a resource manual for airbnb hosts like what they, you're new well what are all the things you can do well you know there's um, property management systems, there's cleaning apps, there's, there's all these things. And it's like, well, I can just put them all in one little place and download it. And then now you're in my ecosystem. And then all I care about is this, whenever you have a trash problem, you call me first, I give you everything else for free. And that's kind of like my, my MO and it's been working. I mean, that's how I'm growing. So. Yes, that's great. I mean, it's also good that people can get access to, access to the gurus, but Education, when it comes to this, I think it's more valuable when it comes from people who wants to give it for free, who wants to teach you like from their heart for you to grow, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and again, also because if you pay thousands of dollars for something, but you feel like there's a missing link, because everybody's different. Like you cannot give everybody 100% of the information because each market is different. Everybody's situation is different. I mean, just in our group alone, it's like, are you a co-host? Are you are you um, arbitraging? Are you an owner? Uh, what's the zoning? What's you know? What's this? What's that? It's like there's so many variables that I I got six kids. I don't got time to be kids father to a million more people. It's just like I'll do the best I can, with you, and I hope you you got to be able to fill in the blanks on your own. But the problem is that the gurus to me sell them all all in one package, and that's what you buy. But there's no such thing. You know, you just have to keep educating yourself, educating yourself. So why, why pretend that that like I'm the I'm the expert or the full answer to everything? I'll give you as much as I can give you, and that's it. And that's all I promise. And I think feel like for me that works. Other people, I'm not gonna knock anybody else. There's some guys out there that I learned from that were great. Like you know, I could start rattling off names, but I know they're about their business. I just could not do what they do as consistently as they do it. So I choose to do it this other way because that's what suits me better. Yes, fully understand and appreciate what you do. So you told me previously that you are currently investing in an Airbnb competitor called WorkBnB, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about this and why did you decided to invest in them? So WorkBnB, um, I love the model because it's basically a B2B business instead of a B2C business, meaning every all the scammers all the people that are coming on airbnb now that are learning how to 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 play the system will be avoided because you're simply dealing with a, an employer and their employees are being placed in these places that person has a lot of incentive to be well behaved because i don't know about you but if my employee goes and has a party at a place that i put him in and wrecks something and costs me thousands of dollars that boy's getting fired, right? So like, it just keeps people more honest. They get paid, you know, people get paid, uh, the hosts get paid up front. There's a, um, there's not a, it, an, it, you can't just like Airbnb be started in 10 minutes. There's a barrier of entry. There's some training you got to take, which I also love. So it keeps out the casual hosts, right? And it deals only with professional. It's a professional platform. And it, it caters, like I said, to a niche and the niche is, um, the niche is, you know, um, infrastructure workers and specifically with me and Yves, the, the, the founder, we're like really trying to be the housing sort of plug for tech companies. Cause we both have tech companies. He has that tech company. I have my tech company and we're trying to like create a little infrastructure of tech companies where we become the people that they go to when they want to place their people in different cities while they're trying to expand their operations since we understand both sides of that that's kind of who we wanted to appeal to so i i invested in them simply because i was like it answers the problem i'm sick of the way airbnb has been treating hosts um 
and making things worse instead of better. And the culture that they've created around, you know, around guests now is just bottom of the barrel and they don't seem to care about it or do too much about it. So this is why I backed the competitor because I was like, I would just rather deal with that type of customer on mm -hmm. a smaller scale and know that I'm not gonna have the rug pulled out of me if something pops up, you know, it's gonna be business. Businesses work together better. Like if you're not a tenant, but a, like if you're a business and your landlord is a business, you're gonna have a different conversation on negotiations than it would be a tenant versus a landlord because that's not business to business. That's, you know, lease or leasee. Mm -hmm. I like that because if there is a problem like another COVID, you can work that out with the business a lot better than you could work it out with an individual because all they want to be like, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm everything's bad. Like they forget that the rest of the world is also hurt. So they don't try to get a mutual sort of satisf mutual um, solution together. I, I also like that about work being me. So I back them. Yes, that's great. Thank you for telling us about it. It's going to be great value for the hosts that might I that might are um, looking to you know invest or work in the same kind of platform you're currently investing in. So thank you so much for that. And yeah, that'd be it for today. Thank you a lot for your time and for all the knowledge you shared with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs>